thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you uh, all for uh, being here. Um, uh, Margarita, yes, interact. So I am uh, proud to be part of this, uh, or a little bit part of this uh, project that uh, examines the issue of interdisciplinarity. Uh, and my paper changed a little bit from the abstract I sent a while ago, which nobody read, I hope. Uh, for two reasons, because there was the USPP meeting in June where we had some interesting debates about interdisciplinarity. And the second thing, of course, we are in Barcelona, uh, so we are um, um, critical, uh, autonomous towards the anarchist, yeah? So we want to um, look at the issue in a different light, okay? So hence, the uh, humanism, numismatics, uh, is the subtitle, and the title is The Critically Informed History of Interdisciplinarity. Okay, that's what I want to uh, address. So um, the, the two issues that are, I think are really important is the issue of uh, interdisciplinarity and, and consciousness or self-consciousness. Does one know that one is engaging in something that is interdisciplinary, okay? Um, and uh, I think it's very important to keep this in mind and to ask the question because otherwise, uh, either we are going to be retrospective yeah? We're going to say, in fact, uh, in the 19th century, they were, they didn't know that these were separate disciplines and they are working on them together. And this is, of course, wrong and we shouldn't be uh, retrospective historians. Or we are going to go into the extreme of the, you know, the Renaissance man, the polymath, Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so the people who do many different things. But this is not very helpful for us, especially if you want to address the other question, which is the question of interdiscipline and, of course, the discipline. Yes, how... Uh, being conscious about making links with others helps or contributes to shaping one's own discipline. Okay, that's the key um, uh, in terms of boundaries and rules, etc. That's the key case. Uh, I bring two case studies, uh, which I take from prehistoric archaeology, because of course prehistoric archaeology is the most important and interesting archaeology of all, yeah, as you agree, but particularly because uh, it is a modern discipline, yes? Uh, uh, prehistoric archaeology dates from um, uh, the you know, second, third of the 19th century, uh, and especially after uh, 1859 and the establishment of high human antiquity. So it is a discipline of its time. It doesn't have the legacies of uh, classical studies, uh, even of medieval archaeology, which uh, uh, can uh, draw back earlier. It's a discipline of modernity. Uh, the two examples I give is um, uh, briefly with Gabriel de Mortier and the notion of uh, uh, natural sciences, and in some more details, and perhaps it will be a bit uh, complex, with uh, John Evans, also a 19th century uh, uh, archaeologist, very important one, uh, who talks about the natural selection of coins, uh, makes a link between coins and flint, etc. Um, and the issues of uh, transition from antiquarianism to archaeology, I'll also mention this uh, in the 20 minutes I have, yes. <coughs> and. Um, uh, I will conclude then with the question of interdisciplinarity, and I will urge us, and I will say this again, to move from a celebratory mode to a more critical uh, appraisal that will be useful for the present uh, 21st century uh, when we are applying for grants, for example. Okay? So uh, the first example is uh, Gabriel de Mortier. Uh, so I said prehistoric archaeology is important. He's dealing with something else, but he's a prehistorian. Yes, he's very famous, Musée de saint germain en etc. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this plate, but it's a very interesting uh, uh, plate that was uh, after, after, just after his death in 1902, I think. And you have the succession of typology of different types that he created, Mortier here in the middle. Um, so he's a flint typology person, but he writes in, in 1879, Les Potiers à l'Ebrog, méthode des sciences naturelles appliquées à l'archéologie. Yes, I don't even need to translate it. Right? Method is not and I think, and this is a question I ask you as uh, colleagues, uh, have a look. If you see uh, this, talk, this type of titles or this type of explicit statement, uh, I am going to apply from somewhere to here. Okay, I don't know if you've seen from this period, from the 18, uh, 1870s. Uh, I think it's fairly precocious, but I I'm looking for your uh, insights on this. Um, and what uh, Gabriel de Mortier is doing in this uh, paper, um, uh, he is arguing about the uh, advantage of... Uh, a prehistoric study, so he's, he's, he's talking as a prehistorian, uh, um, having to listen to all the archaeology, the rigorous, precise method of natural sciences. Only through these methods will archaeology, properly speaking, be able 
uh, to secure rapid and important progress. Okay, so it's a redefinition of the discipline, the old archaeology, the properly speaking archaeology, that is being worked through by the application of uh, an analysis. So for the study of potter's signature to bear its fruit, we must absolutely borrow from a naturalist the exact and impartial method of observation. Yes? Uh, uh, emprunter au naturaliste leur exact et impartial method d'observation. Okay? So you may wonder, I did wonder, what are these methods that come from the naturalist? Okay? And uh, he tells us, it's very surprising, uh, tout d'abord, il s'occupe de nomenclature. Okay? Terminology is extremely important. Uh, you must be precise, etc. I, I should have said, so he's looking at the signatures of Sam Yanwe, of, of uh, uh, Terra Sigilata. Okay? Uh, um, so it's not, it's classical archaeology, but he's looking at it from prehistory uh, at this signature, and he's trying to make a catalog and record, etc. So the most important thing is nomenclature. Uh, only when we are in agreement with this term and the group of subjects will be able to. And after numismatics, after um, nomenclature, comes statistics. Okay, so what he considers to be um, the input of natural sciences um, is the uh, statistics uh, pour arriver à la synthèse, couronnement de toute étude, uh, il faut procéder par l'analyse, aussi précise. Okay, so, um, um, I don't know about you, but it is surprising that he is looking at pottery as a natural scientist, and he's not looking at chemistry. He's not looking at petrography. He's not looking at trace analysis, which are things that existed in his times. Yes, and he's not looking what his colleague Alexandre de Brognard, yes, at the Manufacture des Sèvres. You have a lot of science of ceramics in, in materials. So he's not doing that. Uh, for him, natural sciences is nomenclature and statistics. Okay, that was my first example, and the second example is um, um, John Evans, so a very famous uh, figure, uh, father of Arthur Evans, father of Joan Evans. <clears throat> uh, who did several, uh, three different, I tried to disentangle within his very complex contribution, uh, three different aspects. The first is a, uh, the natural uh, selection of coins, as he called it himself. Uh, the second is his contribution to prehistoric archaeology when he visited uh, Bouchet-Perth in 1859. And the third we'll get there is his, uh, his explicit uh, conscious take on his disciplinary uh, position. So this is, a, I don't know if you've seen this plate, it's a very famous plate oh, um, that he published in 1850. Uh, he's, in fact, his, his first article ever as a numismatist, so coins, you see on the top um, the statue of uh, Philippus II uh, of uh, Macedonia. Uh, that was probably um, uh, coins paid as, uh, to the mercenaries uh, of the empire. And uh, it arrived uh, through Belgium into Britain, because Britain obviously was part of Belgium, this part. Um, uh, and the question that he's addressing is, was the coinage before the Romans arrived in Britain? Okay. Because Julius Caesar, at one point, says that the uh, Roman tribes, they pay their tributes in, uh, uh, in uh, metal lumps and not in coins. So a big question, and this is, of course, a very antiquarian question, is did coinage exist in Britain before the Romans? He's trying to demonstrate that it did by this very, very, very important, very, very, again, important, uh, image which is the, the generation, the transformation uh, of the copy of the copy of the copy of the coins, uh, which he estimates must have taken 150 years. So if the stutter is uh, 330, I don't know, 300 BC, uh, uh, there was uh, enough time for coinage to exist before the Romans arrived in Britain. And this image is so important uh, that it has been uh, adapted by uh, another important guy, which is uh, uh, Petrovus. Uh, Fox, who reproduces this image. You see the evolution of types in ancient Britain, uh, British coins. Uh, and this is one of the very few plates that Petrovus uh, copies from others, because he used to make his own, especially uh, after 1880, when he had all the money and he could employ people. This is, uh, and he talks, I, I won't go into detail, but he says that um, uh, the chariot and horse of the Greek coins of Philip Macedon in the hand of the Gaulish and British artists gradually lost, etc. And he, uh, Petrovus, uh, Applying this model to um, to uh, ethnographic example of uh, decoration of paddles in uh, New Guinea in the uh, um, in the Pacific, and he's applying this model, this gradual transformation model, also to stone artifacts later on. Okay, uh, this transformation model uh, is inspired from the uh, from the coins. Okay, uh, uh, fascinating, but I won't go into detail. And uh, the second point now is that Evans. Um, uh, he's starting to realize that uh, what he was proposing, this, this gradual transformation, 
and echoes with um, uh, the work of um, uh, recent people who we knew personally because they were all in the uh, same club, yes, uh, which is Charles Darwin. So amongst the barbarous nations, the laws which regulate the type of coinage of this kind, consisting of successive copies of copies, are much the same as those which, according to our best naturalist, Darwin, govern the succession of type in the organic kingdom. Okay, so uh, as early, in fact, in, in, already in 1860, so uh, a few months after the publication of Darwin's work, he said, oh, oh what I did resembles, yes, uh, is uh, what we call now the Darwinian archaeology. Again, in 75, he writes a paper at the coinage of Latin Britain and natural selection, <clears throat> where he talks about uh, the succession of type follows certain laws to a great extent analogous to the laws uh, govern, uh, found by the uh, organic life. Okay? Uh, another example from uh, 1890, uh, in fact, and this is very interesting retrospective, in fact, I attempted in 1850 to apply the principles of evolution and natural selection to numismatic inquiries. And when 10 years later, uh, Darwin's great work on the origin of species was published, I found, uh, Monsieur Jourdain, I did prose without knowing, I found that I have been approaching the study of barbaric art on much the same line as those which he conducted in far more important uh, hidden secrets of nature. Okay? Um, very interesting uh, uh, retrospective repositioning of uh, a scholar in a different uh, milieu where different disciplines emerge. Uh, and take, of course, an ascendancy. Uh, and this example again, uh, um, arranging chronological sequences, the morphology, um, again, were published 10 years before the uh, appearance of Darwin's great work on the origin of, of species. Five minutes, okay, good. So what does it mean, uh, 10 years before? It means that maybe uh, this, uh, this model is not Darwinian, okay? Uh, and it is not Darwinian, and it is actually uh, very much closer to another very important figure, <coughs> which is our, our colleague uh, Winkelmann. Yes, uh, Winkelmann, when he talks about uh, you know, Greek art and the degeneration and the gradual transformation of Greek art, he is uh, giving the uh, uh, reflexive elements to, um, uh, to someone like uh, John Evans. So there is a convergence between uh, this sort of antiquarian history of art type of look at the transformation and the new modern uh, sexy uh, grant giving natural history uh, model. <coughs> uh, so very briefly because I have uh, still uh, seven minutes left. Um, so uh, uh, this is the second part of uh, Evans when he is sent in 1950, uh, in 1859 to uh, Bouchet-Pert uh, who claim about his hand axes. And he, uh, the, the key point, he, I, my mission was to look at the objects from an antiquarian point of view. Okay, Joseph Press, which was a geologist, so you have a geologist and an antiquarian point of view at this stone. So he's doing all kind of thing, and he's, uh, uh, I won't go into detail, but he's looking at this, this is a plate from John Evans, he's looking at the hand axes as if they were coins, right? both in terms of illustration, the same illustrators, the nomenclature, patina, striking, Okay, everything is inspired from uh, the numismatic uh, knowledge um, to interpret and to understand uh, a stone artifact. Okay, and the last point, it's almost, uh, almost, almost there. Uh, at the end of his life, John Evans, uh, respected Sir John Evans, I should have mentioned if the uh, British people are offended if someone gets a uh, name Sir and is not uh, mentioned. So Sir John Evans uh, is the president of the um, British Association for the Advancement of Science in 18. Uh, 97 uh, that meets in Toronto and is giving a presidential address um, in which he's uh, uh, doing this precisely his retrospective uh, self-conscious look at what uh, the past 50 years or 60 years of his life has been happening with regards to archaeology. Okay? So it is no doubt uh, hard to define the exact limits which are to be assigned to archaeology as a science and archaeology is a branch of history and belles lettres. A distinction is frequently drawn, etc., etc. It must, however, I go to the next paragraph, be acknowledged a distinction does exist between archaeology proper and what, for want of a better word, we may call antiquarianism. Okay, so this is a moment when antiquarianism uh, becomes the poor cousin, the uh, old-fashioned, the dusty, uh, the uh, um, uh, the localized, the uh, unscientific. <coughs> right, and. Um, uh, so he, he explains 
Uh, of course, it's important to be able to distinguish the styles of uh, the modern characteristics of the styles of Gothic architecture uh, and the English coins, etc. That's very interesting, but uh, it can only entitle its possessor, its possessors, to be enrolled among the votaries of science. Okay? So, uh, in order to uh, 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 in order to approach the boundaries of scientific archaeology, we need uh, to be uh, interdisciplinary, but also we need to uh, put a hierarchy on antiquarianism, okay? Uh, and put it as a lower sense. So this is my concluding slide, okay? <clears throat> um, approaching the boundaries of scientific archaeology, so uh, <coughs> these two examples should help us to think uh, what counts as scientific archaeology, and by um, feedback, what counts as archaeology at all? Uh, and Evans uh, is particularly, uh, Evans is a traitor of the worst kind because he, uh, first of all, he was uh, paid, he, he was paid to go to uh, Abbeville to see Boucher de as an antiquarian. And it is as an antiquarian that he looked at these stone artifacts, okay? And he, even more so, he, there's a correspondence, Darwin uh, at one point writes that uh, he, um, he was shown this object and for him there's a meaningless uh, uh, sh shattered, of stones, he couldn't, Darwin, the non-antiquarian, couldn't see the importance of these stone artifacts. And it's Evans, as an antiquarian, uh, who was uh, able, uh, able to do so. And now, at the end of his life, he is um, downgrading antiquarianism. <clears throat> so uh, clearly there's a crucial role for the humanities, for the belles lettres, classical learning um, uh, in, uh, uh, in prehistoric archaeology. I, I just remind you when, you, when you find some artifacts, yes, and uh, you, you, you draw a table where you write uh, materials, types, dimension, provenance. Okay, have you done this before? So this is an 18th century numismatic practice. If they invented it, okay? And we are following on their footsteps. So why has it been so, the question, now I'm becoming more political to end. Why, why has it been difficult for us to perceive that uh, antiquarianism does have a role an extremely important role to play in the creation of 19th century scientific archaeology. Okay, uh, what has been occluded and what uh, by actors themselves and by subsequent commentators. And on the contrary, what is gained and what is lost by forging particular al alliances with some disciplines. Okay, a strategic realignment tool for generational renewal. Of course, you want to get rid of the old guard and you bring in uh, DNA studies in order to um, do away with the people who are into pottery. Uh, the path that I'm not taking, I think, is an issue that we need to look at, uh, the connections that are missed. Uh, and of course, the uh, interdisciplinarity that goes beyond and above the disciplines, the, the, the importance, you mentioned a bit the religion, but uh, the importance of uh, industry, of commerce, administration, yes, uh, our, uh, we, uh, our bureaucratic practices of science, as even uh, uh, follow the bureaucracy of capitalism. Yes? It's the capitalism who makes ledgers and who uh, audits and balance, and we are doing the same. So this is also a wider field that we need to get into. And uh, really, last point, uh, our, our role uh, as historian is, uh, again, I, I, said, uh, I, I said it earlier and again, not to celebrate, but to, um, uh, to critique, to questions, to uh, ask questions and to be able to uh, eventually to improve, but at least to participate in uh, the 21st century uh, debate about uh, the knowledge we produce, who we produce it for, uh, and why and so forth. Thank you very much. <coughs>